Since 1992, DW Fern Mic preamps, equalizers, and compressors have been used in some of the world's best studios and in private use in home studios around the world. This tutorial will help you get the most from your DW Fern products, learn what each control does, and see the best setup starting points for a variety of recording situations. Learn how to interface our products with the rest of your studio gear. Take a peek inside and see how our products are made. And learn from Doug Fern's experience in over 40 years in pro audio. Hello, my name is Doug Fern and I'm president and founder of DW Fern. We manufacture professional audio recording equipment. Today we're going to talk about the VT4 and VT5 equalizers that we build. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of equalization, where the term came from, where it was originally used, how that uh, concept evolved over the years, how the VT4 and VT5 were designed, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how you use it for a variety of situations, and I'll give you some of my favorite settings that you may find useful uh, as starting points for doing your own recording. This is the VT5. It's a two-channel equalizer, and it supplements the VT4, which is a single-channel version, which we've made for many years. We're going to talk about this equalizer in some detail, but before we do that, let's talk a little bit about the idea of equalization. The term came about primarily from the telephone company because in the early days of the phone system, they realized that the signal from the telephone quickly lost its high frequencies over a fairly short length of wire and it became hard to understand the person on the other end. Hello? Hello? <laughs> now I wonder who that was. So the phone company realized that to, to fix that, they could put in circuitry which modified the frequency response and made the low frequencies and the high frequencies more equal and level than they were prior to that. And that's where the term equalization came from. This became particularly important when radio broadcasting began and networks needed a way to transmit network programming all around the country. The programs were originated generally in New York or Los Angeles, and they needed to provide that signal to the, all the stations along the way. And they're talking something that required better frequency response than you would normally require for a telephone conversation. At that point, equalization became much more sophisticated. And places like Bell Labs and other um, telephone company laboratories in Europe and around the world developed very sophisticated methods of correcting the frequency response of a phone line. Essentially, for the network, the phone line they used was the same as the phone line you used to call your neighbor. Hello, Mrs. Martin. This is Jimmy Matthews. May I please speak to Bobby? It's just that by conditioning that pair of wires, they were able to send that signal all the way around the country and maintain reasonably good frequency response. So like most things in audio, the phone company, particularly Bell Labs, developed all this stuff. By the 30s, essentially everything we know about audio, including all the concepts for digital audio, was established by the phone company, by Bell Labs. They were the experts at equalization. Later, people realized that they could use this same circuitry to not just make the low frequencies and high frequencies equal, but they could also use it to change the overall frequency content of the signal. This was apparent in tone controls on radios. When people got um, radios in their homes in the 1920s, they often had a control that adjusted the tone, which was essentially a new application of the equalization concept. In this case, it may have been used to, to compensate for some deficiency in the original signal, but for the most part, people used it to enhance the signal. And throughout time, as recording became established, uh, this concept of using equalization to enhance the signal, in addition to just correcting it, um, became very important. 
and equalizers became ever more sophisticated because engineers, recording engineers demanded greater precision and greater capability in, in the equalizers that they were using. So why would you use equalization? We, uh, we know right away that there's the correction aspect of it that we talked about before, but there's also reasons why you would want to enhance the sound. Now some of the reasons would be to make the sound more exciting. It can sound better than life, and that can be a useful technique. You can also use equalization to make a variety of instruments fit together better. And you can also use it in, in times to make instruments separate from each other so they can be heard independently. All of those are legitimate uses of equalization, and there are many good tools out there for doing that. The VT4 and VT5 equalizers were not really designed to correct problems. They're designed to take something that sounds pretty good to begin with and make it sound really good, make it sound great, to enhance that last bit of enhancement that's going to really make the difference between a, a mediocre recording and a great recording. And that's the concept behind these equalizers. When I first started recording, I didn't have access to any kind of real equalization. But the first time I had an opportunity to use a console with good equalizers on it was in the early 1970s or mid-1970s with a Neve 1073, and that was really eye-opening. Those equalizers were magnificent, and as soon as I started using that, I said, where have these been all my life? This is the kind, this is the way equalizers are supposed to work. That sound of those Neve equalizers never really left my mind, so when the time came in my development of products to come up with an equalizer, I had several ideas in mind that I wanted uh, wanted to the equalizer to achieve, and and one of those was to have that musicality that the Neve equalizers had, but I also wanted it to avo I wanted to avoid those kinds of of um, distracting kinds of harsh annoying sounds that I found in so many console equalizers. In fact, I'd venture to say that, that I would never use the majority of equalizers that are found on consoles. I just don't find them all that useful. So I had a sound in my mind. It was based on my experience with the Neve and Trident equalizers and some limited amount of experience that I had with Poltec equalizers, which were a very different concept. And in experimenting, with all kinds of different equalizer types, um, <clears throat> it quickly became apparent to me that the passive designs were the ones that appealed to my um, sensibilities. That was what appealed to me. That was the sound I was looking for. So what do we mean by a passive equalizer? Well, there's two basic ways you can achieve equalization in two broad categories. One is called the passive equalizer and one is called the active equalizer. The difference between the two is that a passive equalizer, you just have a circuit comprised of capacitors, inductors, and resistors that modify the frequency response. The only way they can do that is by reducing the level of some frequencies. So in a passive equalizer, when you boost the high frequencies, you're not really increasing their level because the overall equalizer has a certain amount of loss that's always going to be there. You're sort of restoring that loss at those particular frequencies. So overall there's a there's a loss through the whole equalization circuit which requires um, amplifiers to make up for that. And that's a passive equalizer. An active equalizer has some of the same characteristics except the inductors and resistors and capacitors, or in these days more likely just resistors and capacitors, are actually part of the active amplifier circuit itself. So that as you're adjusting those, it's actually changing the gain of the amplifier at those particular frequencies. It's two different ways of achieving the same thing. And in theory, there shouldn't be a whole lot of difference in the, the, the final result. But as it turns out, there is a pretty big difference. And I quickly discovered that in doing some experimenting. And it was also useful for me
to go back to the early days of equalization and Bell Labs, who had figured all this stuff out, like I said, in the 1930s, and see how did they do it? What did they do to make this work? And what I discovered was, which was no big surprise, but it was wonderful to, to have this confirmed, that in an equalizer, there's an infinite number of combinations of resistors, capacitors, and inductors that can achieve the same result. The interesting thing is that they don't all sound the same. So it's important to choose the right values and the right ratios of values in order to make the equalizer sound the way you want it to sound. And it's surprising how little off of optimum that can be and degrade the sound significantly. So in designing the VT4 originally and, and the VT5, uh, I spent a lot of time listening. And if I discovered something that was annoying, uh, I'd say, well, what is that? And how do I get rid of it? So the VT4 equalizer for a long period of time, perhaps close to a year, sat as a prototype on my workbench with a bunch of clip leads coming out of it so that I could rapidly change values of various components so that I could hear what they all did when I changed them. And by doing that, I was able to zero in. I'd change one value and say, oops, that's the wrong direction. That sounds worse. Let's go the other way. And I'd change the component values in the other direction and, and by that method, zero in on the frequencies uh, and the combinations that worked best. So, in addition to just finding the right combinations, it was also important to find the right frequencies because certain instruments and certain sounds have particular frequencies that they seem most um, responsive to when you equalize them. And it's important to find those frequencies and, and work with them so that uh, what you end up with is something that's not only technically good, but also fits the music, because after all, we're making equipment for human ears, not for test equipment. So it's very important to uh, zero in on the sound that you want uh, musically and not necessarily technically.